Now, therefore, understand this, and this is absolutely fundamental to an understanding of Buddhism. Buddhism is a method, it is not a doctrine. Buddhism is a dialogue, and what it states at the beginning is not necessarily what it would state at the end. The, the method of Buddhism is, first of all, a relationship between a teacher and a student. The student creates the teacher by raising a problem and going to someone about it, you see? Now, if he chooses wisely, you see, he'll find this if there's a Buddha around to use as the teacher. And then he says to the Buddha, my problem is that I suffer and I want to escape from suffering. So the Buddha replies, suffering is caused by desire, by Trishna, by craving. If you can stop desiring, then you will solve your problem. Go away and try to stop desiring. And he gives him some methods, how to practice meditation and to make his mind calm and still to see if he can stop desiring. The student goes away and practices this. Then he comes back to the teacher and says, but I can't stop desiring not to desire. What am I to do about that? So the teacher says, try then to stop desiring not to desire. <laughs> now, you can see where this is going to land up. Uh, or he might put it in this way. Uh, all right, if you can't completely stop desiring, do a middle way. That is to say, stop desiring as much as you can stop desiring. And don't desire to stop any more desire than you can stop. See how that's, see where that's going to go? Because he keeps coming back. Because what the teacher has done in saying stop desiring, he has given his student what in Zen Buddhism is called a koan. This is a Japanese word that means a meditation problem. Or more strictly, it means the same thing as case means in law. Because koans are usually based on anecdotes and incidents of the old masters, cases, precedents. But koan, the function of a koan, is a challenge for meditation. Well, who is it that desires not to desire? Who is it that wants to escape from suffering? And here we get to a methodological difference between Hinduism and Buddhism on the question of who are you? The Hindu says, you, yourself, he calls Atman, A-T-M-A-N, the self. And he says now, strive to know the self. Realize I am not my body because I can be aware of my body. I am not my thoughts because I can be aware of my thoughts. I am not my feelings for the same reason. I am not my um, mind, etc., because I can be aware of it. Therefore, I really am other than, above, transcending all these finite aspects of me. Now, the Buddhist has a critique of that. He says, why do you try to escape from yourself as a body? The reason is your body falls apart and you want to escape from it. Why do you want to disidentify yourself from your emotions? The reason is that your emotions are uncomfortable and you want to escape from them. You don't want to have to be afraid. You don't want to have to be in grief or anger. And love even is too much, you see. It involves you in suffering because if you love someone, you have a hostage to fortune. So the Buddhist says the reason why you believe you are the Atman, the eternal self, which in turn is the Brahman, the self of the whole universe, is that you don't want to lose your damn ego. And if you can fix your ego and uh, put it in the safe deposit box of the Lord, uh, you, you think you've still got yourself. 
you haven't really let go. So the Buddhist, the Buddha said there isn't any Atman. He taught the doctrine of Anatman, non-self. Your ego is unreal, and as a matter of fact, there's nothing you can cling to. No refuge, really. Just let go, man. There's no, no, no salvation, no safety, nothing anywhere. You see how clever that was. You see, because he, what he was really saying is, any Atman that you could cling to or think about or believe in wouldn't be the real one. This is the accurate sense of the original um, documents of the Buddha's teaching. If you carefully go through it, that's what he's saying. He's not saying that there isn't the Atman or the Brahman. He says anyone you could conceive wouldn't be it. Anyone you believed in would be the wrong one. Because believing is clinging still. It isn't, uh, there's no salvation through believing. There's only salvation through knowledge. And even then, the highest knowledge is, is non-knowledge. And here he agrees with the Hindus who say in the Upanishads, in the Kena Upanishad, if you think that you know Brahman, you do not know him. But if you know that you do not know the Brahman, you truly know. Why? Well, that's very simple. If you really are it, you don't need to believe in it. And you don't need to know it, just as your eyes don't need to look at themselves, you see? So uh, that's the, the difference of method in Buddhism. Now understand method here. The method is a dialogue. And the so-called teachings of Buddhism are the first opening gambits in the dialogue. And when they say you cannot understand Buddhism out of books, the reason is that the books only give you the opening gambits. Then, having read the book, you have to go on with the method. Now, you can go on with the method without a formal teacher. That is to say, you can conduct the dialogue with yourself or with life. Uh, you have to explore and experiment on such things as could one possibly not desire? Uh, could one possibly concentrate the mind perfectly? Could one possibly do this, that, and the other? And you have to work with it, you see, so that you understand the later things that come after trying these experiments. These later things are the heart of Buddhism. So then, shortly after the Buddha's time, the practice of Buddhism continued as a tremendous ongoing dialogue among the various followers. And eventually they established great universities, such as there was at a place called Nalanda in northern India. This discourse was going on, and if you looked at it superficially, you might think it was nothing but an extremely intellectual bull session, where philosophers were outwitting each other. Actually, the process that was going on was this, that the teacher or guru in every case was examining students as to their beliefs and theories and destroying their beliefs. Showing that any belief that you would propose, any idea about yourself or about the universe that you want to cling to and make something of, use for a crutch, a prop, a security, the teacher demolishes it. This is how the dialogue works until you are left with not a thing to hang on to. Any religion you might propose, even atheism, they'll tear up. Agnosticism they'll destroy. Any kind of belief. They're experts in demolition, so that they finally get you to the point where you've got nothing left to hang on to. Well, then you're free. Because you're it, you see. Once you're hanging on to things, you put it somewhere else, you see, something I can grab. And even when you think as an idea, then I'm it, you're still hanging on to that, they're going to knock that one down. So when you are left without anything at all, you've, you've seen the point. Now that's the method of the dialogue, essentially. That is the Dharma. And all Buddhists make jokes about it. Buddha says in the Diamond Sutra, you see, when I attained complete, perfect, unsurpassed awakening, I didn't attain anything. 
because it's like, uh, to use a metaphor that is used in the scriptures, it's like using an empty fist to deceive a child. So you know, you say to a child, what have I got here? The child gets interested immediately and wants to find out. You hide it and the child climbs all over you, can't get at your face. And finally, you do let him get it and there's nothing in it. Now then, in order to understand this subject properly, I must uh, not take too much for granted. I have to give you some introduction to Buddhism because this is all part of Buddhist philosophy and Buddhism finds its context in the philosophy of India. And we have to go, first of all, very thoroughly into what Buddhism is about. And the first thing I want you to understand about Buddhism that very few people do understand is that Buddhism does not have a doctrine in the same sense that Christianity has a doctrine. There could be no such thing as a Buddhist creed. The word dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A, in Sanskrit, which describes what Buddhism is, Buddhism is called the Buddha Dharma. Dharma means method, not doctrine, not law. It's often translated law. That won't do at all. Dharma sometimes means function. The function of somebody. His dharma means roughly what we would call his vocation. Dharma can also mean, in a peculiar way, a thing, a basic portion of the world, a thing or event. But its primary meaning, as used in the phrase Buddha Dharma, is method. And so Buddhism is a method for something or other. And so for this reason, all Buddhism is a dialectic a discussion, an interchange between a preceptor or guru or teacher and his student, between the Buddha and his disciples. Now, what is it about? First of all, the word Buddha comes from the Sanskrit root Bud, B-U-D-H. And Bud means to be awake. So a Buddha is a person who is awake. It is therefore a title, it's not a proper name, and it's not the name of a divinity. There are many, many gods recognized, angels we might rather call them, in Buddhism, but they are regarded as being inferior to a Buddha. The gods are not yet fully awakened. Buddhism divides the world into six divisions. And uh, this is very important for understanding what's it about. You don't have to take these six divisions literally because they may equally well refer to states of human consciousness. But the six divisions are like this. You see, you draw the circle of the wheel of life. And in the top section of the circle, you have the deva world. And deva, from which we get our word devil, actually means the angels. In, uh, the, the reason is this, that when the, the Iranians had battles with the Aryans, the, the northern Indians, the northern Indians called their gods Deva. So the Persians insulted them by using that word for devils. And then they had here Asura, who were in this division, and these are spirits of wrath. And so opposite Ahura in Persian, Ahura Mazda is the Lord of Light because they were enemies. But so, here are the devas on top. Next to them on this side are the, the powers of divine uh, wrath in the sense of energy, vigor. And below, opposite the devas, are the naraka. And those are the purgatories. That's where everybody is as unhappy as they can possibly be. Here are animals in this section. Here are men and women, and here are things called pretas. Pretas are frustrated spirits with very large stomachs and very small mouths. 
Now, this is the rat race of existence, called samsara in Sanskrit. Samsara, the round of birth and death. And this is the nadir, I mean, this is the zenith, and this is the nadir. This is as high as you can get, that's as low as you can get. And that's always going to happen to you while you work on the principle of a squirrel cage. That is to say, so long as you are trying to make progress, you will go up. But up always implies down. So while you are trying to get better and better and better, that means that when you get to the best, you can only go on to the worst. And so you go round and round and round, ever chasing the illusion that there is something outside yourself, outside your here and now, to be attained that will make things better. And the thing is to recover from that illusion. So a Buddha means somebody who has woken up and discovered that running around this thing may be fun and it may be good to run around, but if you think you're going to get something out of it, you're under illusion because you're forever the donkey with the carrot suspended from his own halter. Now then, it goes on to say that there's only one place, one point in this wheel, from which you can become a Buddha, and that's here. The devas are too happy to become Buddhas, or to worry about becoming a Buddha. The narakas are too miserable. The asuras are too angry. The animals are too dumb, and the pretas too frustrated. Only in the middle position, the position of man, which is, you could say, the equal position, the position of sufficient equanimity to begin to think about getting off this rat race. Only from there, you see, can you become a Buddha. So the position of a Buddha may be represented either as not on the wheel at all or as right in the middle of it. It makes no difference. And so he uh, is just as, in a way, the axle point, the still point of the turning world as to use T.S. Eliot's phrase, uh, is the unmoved center, the unmoved mover, the primum mobile, the axle tree of the world, all sorts, the navel, that's why yogis are said to contemplate their navel. The navel isn't on their tummy, it's this place, the navel of the world. So that's the scheme of cosmology, of ancient Indian cosmology in which Buddhism arises. So you see, therefore, a Buddha is one who awakens from the illusion of samsara. That is, from the thought that there is something to get out of life, that tomorrow will bring it to you, that in the course of time it will be all right. And therefore one is set pursuing time as if you were trying to quench your thirst by drinking salt water. Now, uh, I can exemplify this a little more strongly by relating Buddhism to the social system in which it arose. A Buddhist uh, monk is sometimes called a shramana. S-R-A-M-A-N-A, -A -A, shramana. This is closely allied to the word shaman. And a shaman is the holy man in a culture that is still hunting. It isn't settled, it isn't agrarian. There is a very strong and important difference between a shaman and a priest. A priest receives his ordination from his superiors. He receives something from a tradition which is handed down. A shaman doesn't. He receives his enlightenment by going off into the forest by himself to be completely alone. A shaman is a man, in other words, who has undergone solitariness. He's gone away into the forest to find out who he really is, because it's very difficult to find that out while you're with other people. And the reason is that other people are busy all the time telling you who you are, in many, many ways, by the laws they impose on you, by the behavior ruts they set on you, by the things they tell you, by the fact that they always call you by your name, and by the fact that when you live among people, you have to be in a state of ceaseless chatter. 
But if you want to find out who you are before your father and mother conceived you, who you really are, you almost have to go off by yourself. And go into the forest and stop talking, even stop thinking words, and be absolutely alone. And listen to the great silences. And then, if you're lucky, you recover from the illusion that you're just little me, the so-and-so, and you attain the state of nirvana, which means the blown-out state, the relieved state, the sigh of relief. Nirvana may be translated into English as, phew, I've at last discovered that I don't have to survive. I can survive, of course, but I don't really have to. Because you discover, you see, that what you really are doesn't have to survive because it's what there is. The real you is it, or that, tat tvam asi, that art thou, as the Hindus say. So then, in the normal life of India, which is not a hunting culture, but a settled culture, there are priests, but there is something beyond the priest. That is to say, when a man or woman has fulfilled his or her life in the world of society, it's the normal thing to do for a person to quit their status in society and become what's called a forest dweller. That is almost, you see, to go back to the hunting culture. They divide people into two classes, Grihasta, which means householder, and Vanaprastha, which means forest dweller. And the older people all hand over their occupations and positions to their children and enter the stage of Vanaprastha or become a Shramana and go outside the stockade. I'm speaking metaphorically. They sometimes do, actually. They sometimes don't. And become a nobody. They give up their name. That is to say, the label which designates who they are in terms of caste or class. They become unclassified people. That's why, strictly speaking, you see, Hinduism and Buddhism are not religions. You can classify the religions. You can say, what's your denomination? Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Quaker, etc., 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 you see. But strictly speaking, a Vanaprastha, a Shramana, has no label. He is an unlabeled bottle. So, in uh, the time when the Buddha lived, about 600 BC, The Hindu system had become somewhat uh, decadent. It isn't altogether clear what had happened to it, but it was certain that it did seem in some way to be in need of reform. And so there, there were many reasons for this. And the Buddha, as a young man, being basically troubled by the great problems that we're all troubled with, the problem of suffering and the problem of what all this universe is about, he endeavored to follow the methods that were then being used by people who were shramanas or vanaprastas, forest dwellers. And at that time, it's very apparent that the main method that these people were using was an ascetic discipline starvation, uh, very arduous meditation practices, uh, probably self-flagellation and things of that kind. And it's said that for seven years he practiced these austerities. But he found out that they didn't lead to liberation. And all the people who were practicing them knew they didn't either. But they felt that that was only because they weren't doing it hard enough. And so he propounded instead the middle way, 
the way uh, that led to liberation from the rat race that I've drawn here, neither through austerities nor through uh, pleasure-seeking. See, these are the two ways, the two paths. The people who say uh, the, the whole point of life is to enjoy it, to get the most out of it, you see. And the other people who tried that, and then they found it was sour grapes or something, you know, or they burned their fingers in the pursuit of pleasure. The girl that was so beautiful eventually fell apart or just turned into a shrew and uh, whatever it was. And uh, so they said, instead, let us torment ourselves. And a lot of people enjoy this or get something special out of it. I was in Mexico this summer, and what I went there for was to study Mexican Catholicism where they make a great cult of suffering. And I was very puzzled about this and wanted to understand it. And everywhere, you know, they have these ghastly, uh, tormented Christs, all drooling with blood, hanging on crosses in very contorted positions. And I realized there are certain people who find that the sitting on the tip of a spike is the realest place in the world. Because when you're on the tip of a spike, you know you're there. There's no doubt about it. And also you know that you're expiating for everything. This, uh, somehow by sitting on the, on the spike, you are paying for your guilt. And so long as you hurt, you're all right. See? So these shramanas were doing something of the same kind. And the Buddha became enlightened. Became a Buddha. He woke up. At the moment when... He gave up that kind of quest. The moment he gave up, as we should say, trying to take the kingdom of heaven by storm. Now, what does this mean? It means that in his time, the way of liberation had become competitive, which meant it was on the wrong track. There are a lot of people who we, we call it the holier-than-thou attitude. But we find it today with some objectionable Westerners who go over to Japan to study Zen Buddhism and then come home and brag about the great disciplines they've undergone and say, I sat with my legs crossed in one position for ten hours as distinct from somebody else who only sat for five. And always there's this tendency, you know, to have a marathon and be in a competition with others or with oneself about these things. But the moment you do that, you're back on the wheel. The best thing you can get by asceticism is to get up to the deva world. You can't get anywhere else by it. You may get down to the naraka world by asceticism too. Read the story Thais by Anatole France. So, he found, you see, that the, the real path, the middle way, the meaning of the middle way, is that it's the path that can't be followed. Because to get you onto the middle way, I have to get into a dialogue with you, you see, and you say to me, because after all, it's always the student that raises the problem, not the teacher. You say, well, now, what's the right thing to do? I say back to you, why are you looking for the right thing to do? And then you have to consider your situation, where you are. And you say, well, I'm looking for the right thing to do because I feel that I'm in the wrong situation. I don't have peace of mind. Why do you want peace of mind? Because my mind is disturbed. Then, in other words, you, as a disturbed mind, are trying to find peace of mind. Your quest for peace of mind is the same thing as having a disturbed mind. Now, if you don't have a disturbed mind, you won't ask for peace of mind. Well, how can I quiet my mind? Why are you asking to quiet your mind? Because it's disturbed. You see where you are? So in this way, by this dialogue, the, the guru, the teacher, brings a person back to center. So then this is the point. All Buddhist teaching is a dialogue. Really and truly, the man who goes out and leaves society and becomes a monk is a little bit too much. Buddhism involves this act as a preliminary gesture. But what it comes to 
in the end is the position of what's called a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva means somebody who went out of society, or we should say gave up the world in some way, took on the, the, the robe, took on the discipline. He found what he was looking for, but his finding it was absolutely simultaneous with his coming back into society. And he's called a bodhisattva, as distinct from a pratyeka Buddha, which means a private Buddha, one who goes out and doesn't come back. And the bodhisattva is considered as having a superior attainment, superior insight. So the important thing to remember then is Buddhism is a dialogue. And its teaching is a method, not a doctrine. Now, the teaching of Buddhism is summed up in what are called the Four Noble Truths. The truth of suffering, the truth about the origin of suffering, the truth about the ceasing of suffering, and the truth about the way to the ceasing of suffering. Dukkha, D-U-H-K-H-A, is the Sanskrit word we translate suffering. Discord, frustration, something like that. That's always the problem, you see. And this, because of suffering, is the reason why human beings seek out teachers and saviors. I hurt, and I don't want to hurt. So that's the, the universal problem, you see, that everybody brings. So then the teacher replies to this problem teacher by saying... You suffer because you crave things. Trishna, T-R-I-S-H-N-A, from which we get our word thirst, Trishna, craving or desire, is the cause of suffering. That's the second truth. Now, the Buddhist analyzes this a bit. He says, uh, the world is dukkha, frustration, and it's also characterized by impermanence, Anitya, and by non-entityness, anatman. That means that no thing exists independently. Everything is a thing only in relation to everything else. Therefore, there are no separate things, no real selves or souls or egos. And trying to cling to the world, which is necessarily changing, trying to have a separate self and to protect it, all these things are Trishna. They are the cause of Dukkha. So the teachers, having said this, then the student comes back and says, well, how do I get rid of Trishna? If Trishna, desire, is the cause of suffering, couldn't I get rid of desire so as not to suffer? And the teacher says, well, you try. And this then is the first part of the discipline, to try not to desire, to calm your mind, to practice centering, to practice getting rid of all what they call klesha, K-L-E-S-A, uh, disturbing thoughts, distractions, evil passions, uh, immoderate appetites, and come to upeksha, or equanimity of mind. And so the student practices that. And this is a very difficult and arduous discipline. And all the time he sees the teacher watching him with a slightly sour expression on his face. And he knows, of course, or thinks he knows, that the teacher is fully aware of his inmost thoughts. Because, you know, it's the Indian way. They go to meeting with the teacher, and the teacher sits under a tree and smokes a cigarette or a pipe or something, and all the students sit around cross-legged, and they, they meditate. And sometimes the teacher meditates. And they can see him occasionally looking at them like this, you know. And they think, uh-oh, teacher knows what I'm thinking, because he has the power of infinite vision, you see, and all seeingness. And this bugs them completely. Because, you see, you remember how it was in school when you were trying to do something and the teacher walked around and looked over your shoulder? 
It puts you off completely. And so the Hindu teacher or the Buddhist teacher deliberately puts his students off. And finally, he raises in their minds an insoluble problem, that if you are trying to stop desire so that you will not suffer, aren't you still desiring to stop desire? Or the students may very well find that out for themselves. And they say to the teacher, but how are we to stop desire when we are desiring to stop desire? So then the teacher can engage them in an extremely uh, marvelous trap, which is to say, uh, he, can, he can play it in a number of different directions. One direction is to say, well, don't try to stop all desire, but try to stop as much desire as you can stop. You see where this is going to go. Then they're going to say, well, uh, I'm a little excessive about desiring to stop desire. Well, if you're naturally excessive about it, he says, try to be as, as slightly excessive as you can. You see? How do you see what's leading here? If you follow that course, you are being brought to center in the same way as I demonstrated before. You're being brought to yourself to accept yourself as you are here and now, totally. But you can't do that directly because if you try to accept yourself, you will always find that in yourself there is a spirit of the non-acceptance of things and you have to accept that. So the teacher would say, don't try to accept yourself more than you can accept yourself. Accept yourself as much as you can accept yourself. Because then, you see, you are also accepting the part of you that doesn't accept. Or he may try on another tack. He may say, all right, now, if you've seen that it's that desiring not to desire is simply another form of desire, you, you, you're trying, for example, uh, to get rid of your sensuous appetites. You are going to give up booze and women and uh, uh, pate de foie gras or whatever it may be. And uh, you then think, well, now, yes, this I must do. And eventually you find that you are becoming proud of your success in mastering your appetites. And you're beginning to depend on that. So the teacher says, do you see you're in the same trap as you always were? Formerly you sought spiritual security in booze and women and so on. Now you're seeking it in holiness. Formerly you bound yourself with chains of iron. Now you're bound with chains of gold. Formerly you boasted to all the boys how many sins you committed. Now you're boasting before the Lord of how many virtues you have. Same trap. Why do you do it? So the student eventually finds there's no way at all to not desire. Even desiring not to desire is desiring. Even trying to accept oneself is a way of trying to escape from oneself because one hopes psychotherapeutically that by accepting yourself you will get rid of your nasty symptoms. So you're not accepting them. You're not accepting them by the gimmick, by the pretense of trying to accept them. So this is the way in which the dialogue of Buddhism begins to work. And as it progresses step by step, let me try and show you a little bit more how it works because I'm shortening it enormously in order to give you an outline of the whole thing. What is going on between the teacher and the student, the Buddha and his disciples, is not merely a dialogue. There is the, the verbal dialogue, yes, that goes on. But there also it spread over a long period of time. And in the intervals, the students are practicing meditations. They are making efforts to control their minds and emotions and practicing those things which are the Buddhist equivalents of yoga. So that in parallel to the intellectual discussion, there is going on 
a total devotion of one's whole being to a quest. Morning, noon, and night. And so you see this works up a very considerable uh, psychic alertness. It makes the student put a very considerable psychic investment in the task. And as he goes on, you see, he becomes more and more frustrated. Because as the trap closes, and he finds that it's impossible to do the right thing because the right thing is always done for the wrong reason. When the wrong man uses the right means, the right means work in the wrong way. You see? There is something you could do to attain liberation, or as the Christian would say, union with God, if you could do it. But the Christian would say, by reason of original sin, you can't. Because through original sin, everybody is basically selfish. And you can't be unselfish for a selfish reason. But you have only selfish reasons. So, to him that hath shall be given. But of course he doesn't need it. From him that hath not taken away even that which he had. Poor fellow, what is he to do? So you see, in this way, the teacher closes a trap on the student where he finds himself completely impotent. Not only can he not do anything that will bring about his salvation, he is also unable not to do anything. One might say, uh, you, you must do nothing. You must be completely passive. But you can't do that because the moment you try to be passive, you're doing something. So you get into the state which they call in Zen Buddhism a mosquito biting an iron bull. Or as we would say in our Western idiom, the state when the irresistible force meets the immovable object. Where something must be done, but simply cannot be done. And in this state of maximum frustration, there is an opportunity to understand the situation. To understand that I, the meaning of the state, I cannot do, I cannot not do. The meaning of this state is that the separate I which you thought yourself to be is an illusion. That's why it cannot do and why it cannot not do. You see, what is our I, our ego? Sometime in the development of man, maybe three, four, five thousand years ago, we developed self-consciousness in a peculiar way. We began to realize that by directed thought, we could control our environment. And then it was, you see, that we had a sense of responsibility. Let's just assume for the sake of argument that there was a time when nobody deliberated. They did exactly what they felt like. When you were hungry, you ate. When you were thirsty, you drank. When you were angry, you hit something. When you were happy, you danced. But you never stopped to think what was the right thing to do. You just trusted your intuition, your instincts, your unconscious or whatever it might be called. Well, that was great because nobody worried. Nobody had any problems when it was like that. See, a baby is in the same situation today. Now, maybe you were unsuccessful. Maybe the thing you did spontaneously was absolutely the wrong thing, and the tiger ate you up. Well, that was all right, because it really doesn't matter if the tiger eats you up, so long as you weren't spending your previous time worrying about it. See, everybody dies, and if you die clunk like that, that's that. You don't spend all your life before you die worrying about death. You don't spend all your time before you get sick worrying about getting sick. And when you see you move on that level of unpremeditated, spontaneous behavior, that's the golden age. And the reason people look back with nostalgia to the golden age is because that was the time of irresponsibility. But when people began to see that they could provide for the future and that they could look after things and take care and direct everything, immediately anxiety came into the world. 
See, that was the fall of man. Because then, the moment you start doing that, you begin to think. Now, having thought this question through and decided that such and such is the right thing to do, have I thought it over carefully enough? Now, that's a real bugaboo of a question. You know, you go out of the house and you wonder, did I turn off the gas stove? I think I did, but on the other hand, I'm not quite sure. Let's go back and see. So having gone about five blocks, you walk back. Yes, you did turn it off. So you go out again. You wonder again. Now, I wonder if I really looked or whether I was so keen on finding out that I did turn it off, that some sort of wishful thinking perverted my, my consciousness, and whether I hadn't better check that I really did look properly, you see? Well, this way you never get away. You're trapped. So this, you see, is the problem of all uh, self-conscious beings. They, are, they feel responsibility, then they feel responsible for being responsible and responsible for being responsible for being responsible. And there's no end to it. So, then in this obscure way, everybody wants to get back to the golden age. But they say, if I just acted as I felt, and was completely spontaneous, goodness only knows what would happen. Jesus, you see, said to do that. He did. And everybody reads it in the King James Bible where it means nothing. Take no thought for the morrow, what ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, and wherewithal ye shall be clothed. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. But I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Oh, I mean, it sounds lovely read in church. But what it says, everybody says, oh, 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 no, that's, that's the Sermon on the Mount, and that's not practical. Uh, nobody can do that. That may be for a few saints, but after all, in our practical life as, uh, as practicing Christians in the modern world, we can't do that kind of thing. No. Isn't that funny? Why can't you do it? I mean, that's the real reason for saying it in the first place. Jesus said many very strange things. For example, in the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, how the Pharisee goes up into the front row and says how good he is and that he's fulfilled all his obligations and paid the tithes. And then there's this, this publican who goes into the back and sits there and beats his breast and says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, now that man was the right man. He was justified. But the moment he's told that story, everybody creeps into the back row and says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And they're all in the front row again. <laughs> Nobody can do it, you see. That's why the story is told. In the same way, he says, take no thought for the morrow. Stop being anxious. Like going to a psychiatrist, he says to you, oh, don't worry me, stop being nervous. Can you? See, nobody can. And also, they find out, you see, that really in the end, Nobody can be God. Nobody can make life any better by being responsible about it. Because whatever you gain in that direction, you lose at the same time. By being responsible, we've created civilization, medicine, care of the poor, everything. But what a headache the thing has become. As we solve all our problems, we make more problems. Every problem you solve gives you ten new problems. I'm not saying don't do that, but don't think you're going to get anywhere by doing that. That's one way of arranging it. That's one kind of dance you can have, is to improve everything and have technology. But it doesn't really solve anything. And it's only in the moment you see, when you fully understand that your situation as a human being is completely insoluble, that there is no answer and that you give up looking for the answer, that's, whew, that's nirvana and that's how Buddhism works. So, 
This is connected with the nature of a beautifully functioning mind is that it doesn't get in its own way. It doesn't think itself. If it thinks itself, it gets in its own way because it's a no-think. No-thinks is the background for things. You see? So that's why every con attempt to conceptualize the ground of being, whether it's space or God, is an idolatry. And that's why sages have always condemned idolatry. That it, to, uh, to understand uh, the, the nature of the, the ground of being correctly, you must not have an image of it. Now, we don't need to be compulsive about that. Uh, compulsive uh, iconoclasm is a terrible thing. The, the Islamic people suffered from it from time to time. And when they got to India, they knocked down all the Buddhas and uh, beautiful images and banged off their noses. Uh, and the Puritans uh, did the same sort of thing to Roman Catholic and uh, Anglican churches in England. They hated images. That meant, you see, they were terribly attached to them. They, hadn't, uh, they were still hung up by the images, therefore had to smash them. Uh, either way, uh, if you say, you must not, like, as in, in this very strict orthodox Islamic culture, you must not make any image of any living creature. And so their art, very interestingly, and one must admit, went off into abstract patterning. But what one is saying here not is not that it is somehow just wrong to make an image. The point is much deeper than that. It is this, that in order to realize, in order to experience the ground of being, you need to be free from images. That is to say, you need to suspend the activity called thinking. Now, most people imagine that if they stop thinking, that's sort of the end. The life of the mind there instantly curls up and dies. But um, this isn't the case, because there's a lot more to the mind than thinking. There is this direct apprehension of the world, unmediated through co concepts or thoughts. And that's the kind of apprehension of the world you need to understand space. It's interesting how, to some extent, this sort of thing enters even into the sciences. Because scientists operate with certain, shall we say, it's hard to say concept, with certain tools that are not concepts. You always feel about a concept that you have to know what it is. But for example, the basis of algebra is operating with patterns, uh, and you don't know what they are. They're called unknowns. X is the unknown. You can say X plus Y equals Y plus X, and uh, you've made a perfectly clear statement, but you don't have to know what X is or what Y is. It could mean anything at all. So in the same way, in, in modern geometry, you don't define what you mean by a point. They've abandoned this as a sort of a nonsense definition, Euclid's idea that a point is that which has position but no magnitude. You mean it has position. What has position? And so now a point, everybody knows what a point is, but you don't explain it. Because, you see, there must be a starting point in anything that anybody does, in anything they think about, in any um, system of ideas, any conception of the good life, where you don't explain it. Because everybody knows what it is. 
And yet when you ask them about it, they don't. And you see, we get time and space. If you turn back on your starting point and say, I will not go anywhere, I will not proceed with my geometry, with my investigation, with my business plan, until I am quite sure of my starting point, you will never begin. Because you can go back into your starting point forever. And that uh, manifests itself in people who, for example, have certain kinds of hypochondria. The starting point is the body. And they wonder, my goodness, ought I to go out? Would I catch cold? Uh, would I get into an accident? Or should I go to a foreign country? Would I get the great Siberian itch or the heebie-jeebies or the trots or whatever? And so always worrying about the starting point. Uh, now, are you quite sure that you, your, your, your premises are right? It's always good to look at your premises. But you very quickly come to the conclusion that if you don't have some premises, uh, you won't go anywhere at all. So, uh, as one general once said, a poor plan of attack carried out with zest and uh, uh, determination is much better than an excellent plan carried out in a wobbling way. So, in, in this way, for example, in Japan, I have no idea really about talking Japanese. Uh, I know lots of words and no grammar. Therefore, I have no compunction whatsoever about talking, because I know it's mistakes all over the place, and if I were nervous about it, as they get nervous about talking English, because they do desperately want to be correct, I have absolutely no desire to be correct, because I know that in my whole lifetime I shall never be able to speak correct Japanese. So I just plunge in and I get understood. That's the way you have to do in life, you muddle through. So, if you keep turning back, you see, on the initial beginning point, and trying to be sure of it, uh, nothing will ever happen. So then, whatever is the point, whatever is the ground that we are and that we take our stand upon, appears to us as space, as not being there, to give us transparency. You see, if God were visible, nobody could see anything but God. Uh, it would blot out everything else. But by virtue of becoming invisible, the world is created. Because, uh, as it were, God gets out of the way so that the world can appear. And the world is a selection. As I explained, the eyes select what they see because they are only noticing what goes on in a certain spectrum of light. If you could change the eye spectrum altogether, you'd see a different world of creatures. Flip, 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 you could have the thing like a radio tuning go on from uh, performance to performance, all on different bands of a spectrum. To see them all at once, though, would be for our kind of intellect, like taking your hands like this across the piano and going slam. You see, you just get this chaos of sound. So that there being realized objects in space is uh, partly dependent upon our using an attentive and selective type of consciousness. You see, they're the same thing. If you have a selective consciousness, you have a, a selective world. Uh, so putting down the five fingers on the piano instead of the full flat arm selects a certain pattern of sound. And you can say it's a chord, it's a melody, and so on. So when the angels play their harps in heaven, they are selecting, they're the fingers of God selecting uh, what uh, kind of patterns are appearing in the world, you see. That's, that's really what that means is about. So then, to, to see this then, uh, 
you go back to no thinking. The suspension of thought is for modern man in particular a tremendously important undertaking. When in about 1921, Ludwig Wittgenstein published a book called the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, it was the end of Western philosophy. Uh, because where he finished, he said, you know, philosophy is really a method for getting rid of meaningless concepts. And uh, so he practically got rid of all metaphysical concepts and ended up by saying, uh, whereof one cannot speak, of that one should be silent. This was the great moment for philosophy departments all over the Western world to lapse into silence and practice meditation. But instead, they had to go on talking because they couldn't prove that they were an academic discipline unless they did some talking, especially some publishing. So uh, they began then to chatter uh, nauseatingly about trivialities. Uh, they became grammarians mathematical logicians and things. And uh, everybody forgot about philosophy because it got so dull. It wasn't expressing any more man's fascination and wonder at the in improbable situation of living in the universe. So, uh, but fortunately, things are at last getting through to people. And uh, you would not be entirely laughed out of court in academic surroundings today if you suggested that some non-verbal uh, research be carried on. You'd have to put it rather carefully. You'd have to refrain from calling it yoga or Buddhism or meditation, but it would be sort of uh, research in non-verbal um, sensory awareness or something, you know, some kind of academic gobbledygook. But it's coming. And th this presents problems to people who are compulsive thinkers. Because when they try to reach this completely nonverbal level, they think about doing it. They think, I am trying to reach the nonverbal level. I'm trying to empty my mind of thoughts. I'm trying to think not thinking. You feel so sorry for those people. <laughs> but it is an awful problem if you have it. And uh, to get rid of it then, one uses gimmicks. One uses methods of absorbing the individual in non-conceptual experiences. Uh, such as you can play a single loud musical tone get that going and it really shatters thinking it has you just turns you into this your whole body becomes this one tone you get the person concentrated on that one point you see go 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 and zip cut it off and we're off and that time to collect your thoughts you're blown by this tone and all those uh, techniques that are used in yoga, they, when they chant, when they uh, do some kind of physical exercises, when they have a nonsense proposition like a koan to concentrate on, all these things work in the same essential way to suspend the analytical thinking, to suspend uh, the spotlight mind for a while so that you get back to what is called original mind where you act without thinking. That's why in, in the whole interchange between a Zen teacher and his students, the Zen teacher is constantly challenging the student to respond intelligently to a given situation without thinking, without stopping to think, just as in, say, uh, using judo. You mustn't stop to think. You're lost if you do. You must learn to respond without thinking. So creative skill in so many things depends upon uh, the opposite of thinking.
when you examine what people say, what inventors say, what artists say, what um, uh, mathematicians say about the discovery of new ideas. Very few of them arrived at those ideas by a purely um, thought, thinking, verbal, or numerical process. And the reason is, of course, that the structures which we have arrived at and we do understand by analytical thinking, once you see them, they tend uh, to stay put. They become habits. And there's nothing more difficult to cure in an individual than a habit of thought. You know, I've argued for hours and hours and hours sometimes with people who simply can't understand knowing without a knower. Because they are so trapped by sentence structure. The verb has to have that subject. Therefore, you can't have the state of affairs in which there is just the verb, that is to say, knowing. And they say, well, who is, who is knowing? And it's as bad as arguing with a flat earthist or a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, impossible. Because of the ruts of thought. Now, such a person can never be inventive. Why? Because he will never see a new pattern and a new structure. And he won't see one because he's thinking all the time. He's not open to the variations of the actual world. And so he can only see what he's been taught to see. That's why academic psychology is always in a position of bafflement about learning theory. Because if learning is a process of converting new experience into the terms of what you've already learned, you never really learn at all. It's like according to kind of a narrow-minded aerodynamics, bees cannot fly. Because there's no way of explaining the aerodynamics of that vibration, but it flies. And you often come up against this when an inventor has an idea and all his colleagues say to him, oh, don't be silly. You can't do that. It just wouldn't work. Well, he says, I've tried it and it does work. Or they say, come on. And very often they won't even try. They'll just say it can't be done. You can get a fantastic dogmatism in the scientific world. And you have to be terribly careful not to upset certain absolutely fundamental, strictly prejudices, which are the result of thinking too much and of getting accustomed to the warm ruts of thought and so, you never could see the new. So this is the real meaning of an open mind. Not merely that you're a liberal sort of guy, but that you can turn off thoughts. And yes, thus be turned on to reality. Thoughts, you see, belong to the world of symbols. What we experience with our senses is, of course, the physical world, the real world. You may ask me, well, isn't there also a spiritual world? But you must understand that the spiritual world is the same thing as the physical, when the physical is not confused with the symbolic. There is no real difference between the spiritual and the physical. It's all one energy. All in one space. Now, you see, though, the difficulty is that in saying something like it's all one energy, this is the, really the point. I mean, if you understand that this whole universe is one energy and you're it, you don't really have any, any much in the way of further problems. Uh, I mean, you have some a few practical problems, like uh, how to make a good table or um, a beautiful dress or whatever it is that you're after. But you don't have any more metaphysical problems uh, when you see that. But a person who thinks a lot can't understand that at all. 
Because he says, well, it doesn't make any difference. If everything is all one energy, let's begin again. I mean, uh, what have you said? Of course, we haven't said anything. Logically, the statement is pure nonsense. Everything is one energy. So what? But that's only because the person who has received this communication has had it only as a thought. And as a thought, it's again like saying, there is paper under every word on this page. And thinking that that means that paper, 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 paper. But when this is something that emerges from not thinking, and when you see that um, you've been bamboozled all your life long, you've been bugged by everybody else into thinking that um, you are some kind of a freak that uh, came into this world and uh, you don't really belong here because all your, probably your parents didn't really want you and uh, certainly your brothers, your older brothers and sisters didn't want you around, you were eating up more. And uh, in school they tell you, you know, you've got to learn that you're not the only pebble on the beach and that, uh, therefore the best way of teaching you that is that uh, you're really rather insufferable around here and you're on probation until you uh, are acceptable. Well, babies then grow up, you see, with this treatment, feeling strangers, feeling that the earth is something alien. And so we all have this feeling of, uh, of being alone, of being impotent little puppets of a huge system going on. And so we are progressively fooled out of, really with our own cooperation, fooled out of this sense that you can get if you suspend all these identifications that one does with the thinking process. This is this, this is that. I'm me, what's me is different from so on. You suspend that. You see, not simply that all those problems and all those definitions of who you are were unreal. There's something else. You see, there's the feeling beyond having dissipated the illusion of the sheer um, joy and delight of this one energy now is realizing itself as you. And uh, how nice that um, it won't always be doing that because that would get boring. It'll go like this, you see. And uh, it'll be a different situation altogether. Uh, you know, you'll run into a brick wall and before you know where you are, you're uh, doing beep, 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 beep <laughs> out of an eggshell. <laughs> uh, the whole thing is flipped and you're doing it on, on another track. But there's only one you, you see. It's all the one energy. But this is, as I say, difficult to understand logically if you don't understand it experimentally. If you understand it experimentally, it's perfectly clear when somebody says everything is one energy. You say, of course. But the person who's stuck with the concept and has nothing more than the concept can't, can't, simply can't make any sense of it at all. And he says, well, you're suffering from a hallucination. And we'll proceed to prove, according to his ideas, that what you've achieved in that has made no difference to you or to anything else. And of course, he can prove it. Because his proof is uh, set up to give just that result. Well then, I got into that at some length, the, the question of no thinking, because of trying to point out how one uh, must avoid trying to understand space uh, 
uh, in such a way as to make it a thing. Like a box, you see, which contains all the objects in it. But a no thing, like space, is at the same time in cahoots with things. There are two aspects, two poles, two terms of the same one energy. Don't make space at the same pole of the one energy as the thing. It's the opposite pole. It is then because of our treatment of space as nothing, you see, that we are afraid of death. We are afraid of that pole of experience, which is unconsciousness, that corresponds to space uh, surrounding the world. And because we think that reality, that our life, that our identity is entirely in the domain of consciousness and thingness and thinkableness, the other pole seems completely threatened. Whereas, of course, it is that on which it all depends, because the two poles depend on each other. They energize each other. So when you um, are scared of the non-being side of things, you are, as it were, frightened of your own mother. Now, of course, you may have reason to be, because there are such things as devouring mothers. But the devouring mother represents uh, the original horror felt for the unknown. And uh, in practice, in human relationships, uh, the devouring type of mother is uh, precisely the person who cannot come to terms with her own unknown. Therefore, she wants to control everything. She wants to see that all her children remain perpetually under her dominance. But she can't let go. As if she let go, you know, she'd become uncorseted and flop all over the place, as it were. In 1925, Mahatma Gandhi wrote the following words. I find a solace in the Bhagavad Gita that I miss even in the Sermon on the Mount. When disappointment stares me in the face, and all alone I see not one ray of light, I go back to the Bhagavad Gita. I find a verse here and a verse there, and I immediately begin to smile in the midst of overwhelming tragedies. And my life has been full of external tragedies. And if they have left no visible, no indelible scar on me, I owe it all to the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. In this passage that I have just quoted to you, Mahatma Gandhi was referring to what is perhaps the most famous of all the spiritual classics of India. The Bhagavad Gita or Bhagavad the Lord Gita Song, the Song of the Lord. It is spelled B-H-A-G-A-V-A-D, Bhagavad, Gita, G-I-T-A, the Song of the Lord. The Lord, in this case, being Sri Krishna, who in Hindu mythology is regarded as an incarnation, an embodiment, in the Sanskrit language, an avatar of Vishnu, the Supreme Lord, the personification of the ultimate reality underlying this universe. The Bhagavad Gita was probably compiled about the 5th century BC, and it forms a part of a great epic called the Mahabharata. It's attributed to a sage by the name of Vyasa, and contains a complete epitome of the whole central doctrine of Hinduism known as the Vedanta. It's a very fascinating and to us puzzling fact that Gandhi, preeminently the man of non-violence in modern times, was so devoted to this book. Because the scene with which the book opens is a battlefield, the field of Kuru, where a young prince by the name of Arjuna is riding in his chariot 
and Sri Krishna, the incarnation of Vishnu, is his charioteer. As the opposing armies face each other, and the battle is about to begin, and Arjuna is faint in heart, oppressed with the senselessness of this struggle and of internecine warfare. And the Gita says in the first chapter, He was overcome with great compassion and uttered this in sadness. When I see my own people arrayed and eager for fight, O Krishna, my limbs quail, my mouth goes dry, my body shakes and my hair stands on end. And I see evil omens, O Krishna, nor do I foresee any good by slaying my own people in the fight. I do not long for victory, O Krishna, nor kingdom, nor pleasures. Of what use is kingdom to us, O Krishna, or enjoyment, or even life? And having spoken thus on the field of battle, Arjuna sank down on the seat of his chariot, casting away his bow and arrow, his spirit overwhelmed by sorrow. And to this complaint his charioteer, the Lord Krishna, replies, Whence has come to thee this stain, this dejection of spirit in this hour of crisis? It is unknown to men of noble mind. Yield not to this unmanliness, O Arjuna, for it does not become thee. Cast off this petty faint-heartedness, and arise, O oppressor of the foes. And to give point to his words, Krishna goes on, Thou grievest for those for whom thou shouldst not grieve. And yet thou speakest words about wisdom. Wise men do not grieve for the dead, nor for the living. Never was there a time when I was not, nor thou, nor these lords of men. Nor will there ever be a time hereafter when we shall cease to be. As the soul passes in this body through childhood, youth, and age, even so is its taking of another body. The sage is not perplexed by this. Heat and cold, pleasure and pain come and go and do not last forever. These learn to endure. The man who is not troubled by these, O chief of men, who remains the same in pain and pleasure, who is wise, makes himself fit for eternal life. Of the non-existent, there is no coming to be. Of the existent, there is no ceasing to be. The conclusion about these two has been perceived by the seers of truth. Know thou that that by which all this is pervaded is indestructible. Of this immutable being, no one can bring about the destruction. It is said that these bodies of the eternal embodied, which is indestructible and incomprehensible, come to an end. Therefore fight, O Arjuna. He who thinks that this slays, and he who thinks that this is slain, both of them fail to perceive the truth. This one neither slays nor is slain. He is never born, nor does he die at any time. Nor having come to be, does he again cease to be. He is unborn, eternal, permanent, and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. Now, it's obvious, I think, to those of you who have listened to any other of these programs, what Sri Krishna is talking about here. When I was talking to you about the Upanishads, I explained, at several points, the fundamental doctrine of the Hindus. And that is that the innermost reality of man is not quite, quite what we who have been brought up in a Christian tradition call the soul. We have an inherited teaching, of course, of an immortal and individual soul, which is the root principle of every human being. But in the Hindu doctrines, the soul is not individual. The soul is supra-individual, or, as they would say in their technical language, the Atman, the soul, or self. Self is really a better translation than soul. The Atman is identical with Brahman, and Brahman is the name which they use for the ultimate reality which underlies this whole universe. Now, I don't want you to think of Brahman as a sort of vast blob of perfectly transparent jello, which 
penetrates the whole world. I, I think that's what many people imagine when they hear this kind of thing. The whole point of the Brahman idea is missed. When you form any image of it in your mind at all, even jello, even empty space or boundless light, Brahman is what we ourselves really are, what this whole universe is fundamentally and actually. There is no way of thinking about, of imagining that. For the very simple reason that as water cannot rise higher than its own level, thought cannot think what is higher than thinking. It cannot conceive the mind which thinks, and still less, the power which generates the mind. Our symbols for, our ideas about this supreme reality, are vagueish and voidish, not at all because that reality is vague and void, but because thought and imagination are annihilated in trying to grasp it. The essential teaching which the Gita is trying to convey is that the real center and soul, the basic reality of you and I, is not the superficial consciousness which we ordinarily call myself. What we are fundamentally is this unthinkable source of life and existence named Brahman the Expansive. Nor must we confuse this unthinkable center of our lives with a sort of inner stuff, a so-called blind force. For one doesn't derive life and consciousness, feeling and reason from mere stuff, as if the dead were able to give birth to the living. You know, this notion of blind force as the ultimate reality, which has been popularized by a facile scientism, is merely the result of the fact that when the human mind gets out of its depth, it drowns and vomits up a lot of dead ideas. And so Sri Krishna goes on. He who knows that it is indestructible and eternal, uncreated and unchanging, how can such a person slay anyone, O Arjuna, or cause anyone to slay? Just as a person casts off worn-out garments and puts on others that are new, even so does the embodied soul cast off worn-out bodies and take on others that are new. Weapons do not cleave this self. Fire does not burn him. Waters do not make him wet, nor does the wind make him dry. He is uncleavable. He cannot be burned. He can neither be wetted nor dried. He is eternal, all-pervading, unchanging and immovable. He is the same forever. He is said to be manifest, unmanifest, unthinkable and unchanging. Therefore, knowing him as such, thou shouldst not grieve. Even if thou thinkest that the self is perpetually born and perpetually dies, even then, O mighty armed, thou shouldst not grieve. For to the one that is born, death is certain. And certain is birth for the one that has died. Therefore, for what is unavoidable, thou shouldst not grieve. Perhaps that last passage needs a little bit of interpretation. For to one that is born, death is certain, is a statement, of course, which is obvious enough. But not so obvious to us is, and certain is birth for the one that has died. I should try to explain this a little bit, because... It's a passage expressive of what is called in India the doctrine of rebirth or reincarnation. If you will think for a moment of what you were before you were born, you will come to the rather puzzling conclusion that you, before you were born, are impossible to think about. Before you were conceived by your father and mother in the womb, you can't remember anything. You don't even remember darkness, not even a blank. Your background, your past history, right at its beginning, seems to be a state of complete annihilation of your ego, of your personality. And yet, oddly enough, here you are. After you die, you may presumably go again into a state 
which we can imagine only as complete annihilation, of complete nothingness. And if so, you will, won't you, be in the same sort of condition as you were before you were born. You came out of that state, though. Should you be afraid to return to it? This is perhaps a rather elementary way of expressing the Hindu doctrine of rebirth. But I don't want to give the impression that the Hindu doctrine is as it is imagined to be by many people in the West, a doctrine of the reappearance again and again in this life of an individual soul. I think it is true to say that according to the strict doctrine of the Vedanta, there is not an individual soul which passes from life to life. The one who transmigrates is precisely this Atman or Brahman, and this is why we have to imagine the state before birth and after death as blank annihilation. Because thought is annihilated in trying to grasp the reality which lies deeper than thinking. The finger that struggles to touch its own tip finds only the empty air. And so Krishna goes on. The dweller in the body of everyone, O Arjuna, is eternal and can never be slain. Therefore thou shouldst not grieve for any creature. Further, having regard for thine own duty, thou shouldst not falter. There exists no greater good for a kshatriya than a war enjoined by duty. I think it is just at this point that we puzzle about this book in relation to Mahatma Gandhi. Let me explain the passage that I've just read. A kshatriya is a member of one of the three great castes of Hindu society. Those castes being, respectively, Brahmana, which is the priestly caste, the Sacerdotium, Kshatriya, the caste of warriors and rulers, Vaishya, the caste of merchants. And they're roughly equivalent to the Lord's spiritual, the Lord's temporal, and the commons of medieval European society. And each caste has its proper duty in life, which, in Sanskrit, is Svadharma. And this is the phrase which Krishna uses here when he says, Having regard for thine own duty, for thine own Svadharma. Sva, self, dharma, function. Or Svadharma is probably best translated into English as vocation. The Kshatriya is one who has a vocation to fight. That's his job. Whereas a Brahmin, or more particularly, one who has gone beyond caste altogether, one who in India is called a sannyasin, corresponding in the medieval West to the monks and hermits, those who have gone outside society, they do not have the vocation or the duty of fighting. I think the clue to the problem of the Gita especially in relation to that great non-violent man, Gandhi, is this. Primarily, Arjuna's objection to taking part in war is a sentimental one. He is unwilling to fight in the battle because of his depressed emotions in regard to slaying his kinsmen, or, we would say, in regard to slaying one's fellow man. If one would be a pacifist because one is merely squeamish, and is the kind of person of whom one would say, well, he couldn't even hurt a fly, then surely there is something phony about such pacifism because it is sentimental. This does seem to be Arjuna's objection. And this is why Krishna says, in effect, your objection to slaying is a fear of slaying, a squeamishness to slay. And because of this, you do not have a genuine objection to slaying. If you refrain from taking part in battle because you are frightened of so doing, or because you are sentimental, you are not the kind of person who really has a right to abstain from battle. Now, why does he say this? The reason is that to the Hindu mind, one who abstains from what might be an evil action through fear has not really liberated himself from evil. Krishna would say, that so long as our conduct is motivated by fear on the one hand, or by desire on the other, 
we are incapable of performing a truly moral action. Only those actions are truly moral which are unmotivated, because if you are motivated to do good by fear, your good may, under other circumstances, be evil. This is the case with Arjuna. He wants to refrain from war for the same reason for which many other people would engage in war. Many people engage in war because they're afraid, and not at all because they hate. The world situation at the present time might be said to be a situation of mutual fear, where the only reason why someone might start a war would be for fear of the other side starting it first. After all, we all know now that modern warfare is something in which neither side wins. It is then fear more than anything else. Fear that the other fellow should send the bombs over first is what starts a war. And thus, you see, fear is no deterrent to war at all. A person whose reluctance to fight is based on fear or squeamishness does not, then, in Krishna's view, have the right to renounce it. And you see here, the view is one which would probably commend itself to a man like Gandhi. Because you could turn it round in the other way and say that a person who has to take the step of being a non-violent man, a man of peace, a pacifist, he would have his vocation and his duty to do in exactly the same way as the Kshatriya, the warrior. He must not be non-violent on sentimental grounds, but rather because he sees it as his Svadharma, that is to say, his vocation in life. And so, a moment later, Krishna formulates the principle of action. He says, Therefore arise, O son of Kunti, Arjuna, resolved on battle, treating alike pleasure and pain, gain and loss, victory and defeat. To action alone hast thou a right, never at all to its fruits. Let not the fruits of action be thy motive, neither let there be in thee any attachment to inaction. Fixed in yoga, that is to say, in union with the principle, with the self, do thy work, O winner of wealth, abandoning attachment with an even mind in success and failure, for evenness of mind is called yoga. One who has yoked his intelligence with the divine casts away even here both good and evil. Therefore strive for yoga. Yoga is skill in action. The principle you see which he enunciates is to act without attachment to the fruits of action, to do what you have to do without seeking either evil or good from it. Now this is simply another way of saying to act without motive. It seems, of course, from our point of view, impossible that a human being should act without motive. In our Western way of thinking about ethics, we judge the quality of an action by the quality of the motive. And the whole notion of an action without a motive at all seems to be extraordinarily foreign to us. But as a matter of fact, if there is no such thing as an action without motive, there is no such thing as a free or moral action. Because, so long as we have a motive, our actions are not actions, they are simply reactions. Surely it's obvious that our motives are determined by our conditioning, by our environment, our heredity, our social structure. They give us motives, and these motives of the past determine the way in which we act. Now, if my motive for doing good is for the sake of some sort of a reward, whether it's in the ancient sense of going to heaven, or the modern sense of being a real person, or a regular guy, or whether it's a fear in the ancient sense of going to hell, or in the modern sense of being a cad, I act motivatedly. And therefore, the things which I do by way of moral action are not actually free. If, as we in the West have rather inconsistently but nevertheless rightly insisted, a moral man must be a free man, a free man must be an unmotivated man. 
In Western Christianity, it has always been thought that there is only one unmotivated being, and this would be God. In the words of the ancient hymn in the Catholic breviary, God is creation's secret force, thyself unmoved, all motion's source. God, then, would be the one who would act without motive, who would act spontaneously from himself without having to be pushed around. The point, you see, of the Hindu teaching is that in reality, each one of us is that unmoved one, that unmotivated one. The root and ground of our soul and mind is the same as the root and ground of this whole universe. Therefore, one in whom this is fully realized can act in an unmotivated way. In studying the philosophy of the Hindus, we have to get used to the idea that it's really an illusion to suppose that every event is motivated, determined, or caused by the past. What they call karma, or causation by the past, is in fact maya, or unreality. For in the Hindu philosophy, the present of the universe, or the eternal now of the universe, is not the consequence of its past, but rather, the past is always the consequence of the present, of the eternal now. It trails behind it like the wake of a ship. It does not stand before it and push it. And thus, it is through the realization that he is that eternal now, not his past, that Arjuna is able to act in a free way, in an unmotivated way, and thus go into battle, not because he is moved to fight by hate, by squeamishness or fear, but because he carries out his appointed place in a society in which it's his vocation to be a warrior. We may think it regrettable that societies exist in which there is a vocation to be a warrior, but let's not be sentimental in this respect also, because every one of us is unable to live at all without killing something. Some of us would like to rule out altogether the killing of our fellow men. But you see, in the Hindu view of life, there isn't this rigid distinction between man on the one hand and animals and plants on the other, which exists for us in the West. Therefore, there are times in the Hindu view when killing is an unavoidable condition of being alive. And this is one of the problems which the Gita sets itself to solve. Everybody should do in their lifetime sometime two things. One is to consider death, to observe skulls and skeletons, and to wonder what it will be like to go to sleep and never wake up. Never. That uh, is the most, is a very gloomy uh, thing for contemplation, but it's like manure. Just as manure fertilizes the plants and so on, so the contemplation of death and the acceptance of death is very highly generative of creative life. You get wonderful things out of that. And the other thing to contemplate is to follow the possibility of the idea that you are totally selfish. That you don't have a good thing to be said for you at all. You are a complete, utter rascal. Now, when you go deeply into the nature of selfishness, what do you discover? You say, I love myself, I seek my own advantage. Now, what is the self that I love? What do I want? And that becomes an increasingly ever-deepening puzzle. Now, I've often referred to this when you say to somebody else, I love you. It's always rather disconcerting to the person to whom you say that. If you imply that you love them with a pure, disinterested, and holy love, they automatically suspect it as being a little bit phony. But if you say, 
I love you so much I could eat you. That's an expression, uh, as a way of saying to a person, you attract me so much that I can't help it. I'm absolutely bowled over by you, I'm gone. And people like that. Then they feel they're really being loved, that it's absolutely genuine. But now, I love you so much I could eat you. Now what the devil do I want? I certainly don't want to eat the girl in the sense of literally devouring her, because then she'd disappear. <sighs> but I love myself. And what is me? How do, in what way do I know me? When it suddenly occurs to me that I know me only in terms of you. And that the main task of the psychotherapist is to do what he called to integrate the evil. To, as it were, put the devil in us in its proper function. Because you see, it's always the devil, the unacknowledged one, the outcast, the scapegoat, the bastard, the bad guy, you see, the black sheep of the family. It's always from that point that generation comes. In other words, uh, in the same way as in the drama, uh, to have the play, it's necessary to introduce a villain. It's necessary to introduce a certain element of trouble. So in the whole scheme of life, there has to be the shadow, because without the shadow, there can't be the substance. So this is why there is a very strange association between crime and all naughty things and holiness. Well, you see, holiness is way beyond being good. Good people aren't necessarily holy people. A holy person is one who is whole, who has, as it were, reconciled his opposites. And so there's always something slightly scary about holy people. And other people react to them in very strange ways. They can't make up their minds whether they're saints or devils. And so holy people have throughout history always created a great deal of trouble along with their creative results. Let's take Jesus, for example. Trouble that Jesus created is absolutely incalculable. Think of the Crusades, the Inquisition, the heaven only knows what's gone on in the name of Jesus. Very remarkable. Freud's a big troublemaker. Jung had a tremendous humor. And he knew that nobody can be completely honest. That you will try and you will have a great deal of success in uh, exploring your motivations and your dark, unconscious depths. But there will be a certain point at which you will say, well, I've had enough of that. Do you see how, in a strange way, there's a certain sanity in that? When a person indulges in a certain kind of duplicity, of deception, there is something, you all laughed when I said that, there's something humorous about it. And this humor is a very funny thing. Basically, humor is an attitude of laughter about oneself. There is malicious humor, or, which is laughing at other people. But real deep humor is laughter at oneself. Now, why fundamentally do you laugh about yourself? What makes you laugh about yourself? Isn't it because you know that there is a big difference between what goes on the outside and what goes on the inside. Now, I passed you around a lot of embroidery to look at before we started. And I'm perfectly sure that you got the point that there's a big difference between the front and the back. <coughs> In some forms of embroidery, the back is very different from the front because people take shortcuts. In the front, everything is orderly and it is supposed to be kind of messy on the back side. See, which side will you wear? You've got to be sure you get the front in the front, and have the back in the back. The back has all the little tricks in it, all the shortcuts, all the lowdown that people don't acknowledge, see? And it's exactly the same with the way we live. You know, like sweeping the dust under the carpet in a hurry just before the guests come. I mean, we do ever so many things like that. And if you don't do it, if you don't think you do it, and you think, well, really, I, my embroidery is the same on both sides, see? Well, you're deceiving yourself.
because what you're doing is you're taking the shortcuts in another dimension, which you're keeping out of consciousness. Everybody takes the shortcuts, everybody plays tricks, everybody has in himself an element of duplicity, of deception. Because you see, from this point of view that I'm discussing, where the web is the trap, to be is to deceive. Think of camouflage, the chameleon who changes its color. Think of the butterfly pretending it has eyes. Think of the flower saying to the bee, like my honey. The bee says, wow. But then that means that the bee has to be, and it has to go on living, and all the trouble it takes to go around collecting honey and raising other bees and organizing itself and doing that dance which tells the other bees where there's more honey. There's all that stuff to do. Oh, I was deceptive. Now, in the same way, I've often said life is, is a drama, and a drama is a deception. It's a big act. When you peel an onion and you don't really understand the nature of an onion, you might look for the pit in the center, like any ordinary fruit has. But the onion doesn't have a center. It's all skins. So when you get right down, there's nothing but a bunch of skins. You say, well, that was a kind of disappointing. Well, in rather the same way, you see, you find when you explore yourself uh, and your motivations and you go through and through and you try to find out that thing which is really genuine. So you explore the onion and you go in and in and in and then you find, well, uh, it's all a deception. Now then the question arises, who's deceiving who? Who's fooling who? I'm fooling me? What is fooling? Fooling is playing like you're there when you're not. You know, getting somebody else to answer your name in the roll call. So, we're all, you see, this is the metaphysical basis of it. This is what the Hindus mean by maya, the world illusion. The world is playing it's there when it isn't. And it's a trap. And it sucks you in. And you can't get out of it. And it's a thorough big trap, too. But always, when you get an idea like this, or a feeling like this, Follow it to its extreme. Don't back out from it. If you find you're selfish, go to the extreme of what selfishness means. Confusion largely results from not following feelings or ideas to their depth. You know, people think they want to be immortal. They'd like to live forever. Do you really want to do that? Think about it. Really go into it, what it would be like. People say they want this, that, and the other. They want this kind of car, they want this kind of dress, or so on, and uh, this much money, and so on. It's always a good idea to think it right through. What it would involve to be in that situation, to have those desires fulfilled. Also, when you form a relationship to another person, think it through, too. You see? How inconvenient would they be? However attractive. And, uh... Always turn the em embroidery round and look at the underside, but don't get caught doing it. See, that's something one does on the side in secret. Because otherwise you play the game that everything is as it's supposed to be on the front. But that makes you humorous, and that makes you human. I don't know what I want. But when you don't know what you want, you re reach the state of desirelessness. When you really don't know. Do you see, there's a, there's a beginning stage of not knowing and there's an ending stage of not knowing. In the beginning stage, you don't know what you want because you haven't thought about it. Or you've only thought superficially. And then when you, somebody forces you to think about it and go through and say, yeah, I think I like this, I think I like that, I think I like the other, there's the middle stage. And then you get beyond that. Say, is that what I really want? In the end you say, no, I don't think that's it. 
I might be satisfied with it for a while, and I wouldn't turn my nose up at it. But it's not really what I want. Why don't you really know what you want? Two reasons that you don't really know what you want. Number one, you have it. Number two, you don't know yourself. Because you never can. The Godhead is never an object of its own knowledge. Just as a knife doesn't cut itself, fire doesn't burn itself, light doesn't illumine itself. It's always an endless mystery to itself. I don't know. And this I don't know, uttered in the infinite interior of the spirit, this I don't know is the same thing as I love, I let go, I don't try to force or control. It's the same thing as humility. And so the Upanishads say, if you think that you understand Brahman, you do not understand. And you have yet to be instructed further. If you know that you do not understand, then you truly understand. For the Brahman is unknown to those who know it, and known to those who know it not. And the principle is that any time you, as it were, voluntarily let up control, in other words, cease to cling to yourself, <coughs> you have an access of power. Because you're wasting energy all the time in self-defense, trying to manage things, trying to force things to conform to your will. The moment you stop doing that, that wasted energy is available. And therefore, you are, in that sense, having that energy available, you are one with the divine principle. You have the energy. When you're trying, however, to act as if you were God, that is to say, you don't trust anybody and you're the dictator and you have to keep everybody in line, you lose the divine energy. Because what you're doing is simply defending yourself. So then, the principle is, the more you give it away, the more it comes back. Now you say, I don't have the courage to give it away. I'm afraid. And you can only overcome that by realizing, you better give it away because there's no way of holding on to it. The meaning of the fact, you see, that everything is dissolving constantly, that we're all falling apart, we're all in a process of constant death, and that uh, the world they hope men set their hearts upon turns ashes or it prospers and like snow upon the desert's dusty face lighting a little hour to his dawn. You know, all that Omar Khayyam jazz. You know, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the great globe itself, I, all which it inherits, shall dissolve and like this insubstantial pageant faded leave not a rack behind. All falling apart. Everything is. That's the, the great assistance to you. See, that, that fact that everything is in decay is your helper. That is allowing you that you don't have to let go because there's nothing to hold on to. It's achieved for you, in other words, by the process of nature. So once you see that uh, you just don't have a prayer, and it's all washed up, and that you will vanish and leave not a rack behind, and you really get with that, suddenly you find you have the power. This enormous access of energy. But it's not power that came to you because you grabbed it. It came in entirely the opposite way. And power that comes to you in that opposite way is power with which you can be trusted. Of course, what we've been talking about is not so much a set of ideas as an experience or shall we say experiencing and uh, this kind of seminar in comparison with uh, encounter groups or workshops of various kinds or experiments in sensory awareness is now being called a conceptual seminar although I'm not talking about concepts but the crucial question arises that an understanding, a real feeling understanding of the polar relationship between the individual and the world is something that operates, uh, as we say, in your bones and isn't, 
than just a view that you hold or a belief that you hold. It's so curious that the emphasis of the Western tradition in religion is primarily upon right belief. Do you believe in the right dogmas and the right doctrines? And only secondarily upon right action, because what you believe is in Christianity at any rate, far more important than what you do, because one is saved through faith, not by works. And early in its history, the Christian church re rejected the movement in the church which had been known as Gnosticism, from the Greek Gnosis, which means knowledge. And in a way, there were some sound reasons for doing so, because the Gnostics were what I would call anti-materialists. They divided human beings into three classes that were called, respectively, pneumatic, psychic, and hylic. The last one being H-Y-L-I-C, from the Greek, hyli, or they would call it now, ile, ili, meaning wood. So the people were spiritual, psychological, and wooden. And uh, that is to say, the wooden people were those most absorbed in materiality and most closely identified with their bodies. And Orthodox Christianity re rejected this sort of distinction because of the perfectly correct idea that material existence is not inconsistent with spirituality. This is something which most Christians have forgotten, but they do believe as the central principle of Christianity in what's called the Incarnation, that in uh, the Jesus of Nazareth, Almighty God did in fact become material, become human. And by this process, initiated a transformation of the cosmos. In the words of St. Athanasius, God became man, that man might become God. And you don't hear that from the pulpit very often. The Christian church therefore emphasized pistis or faith as against gnosis or knowledge because they said you can never know God. God could never become an object of knowledge. And in this funny roundabout way, the Christian theologians were saying exactly the same thing as the Hindus. Only the Hindus do call this knowledge of God through faith, they call it jnana, which is the same as the Greek word gnosis. But just to give you a little sidelight on how words get mixed up in their meanings, we now have a class of person called an agnostic. And uh, an agnostic generally means a person who doesn't commit himself to any beliefs about the ultimate nature of things. He just says he doesn't know. But the original word, agnosia in Greek, meant a special kind of knowledge. It was called the dark knowledge of God. The knowledge of God in the cloud of unknowing, to use the title of a mystical treatise written by an anonymous 14th century English monk. This monk derived his ideas from a very mysterious figure who wrote under the name of Dionysius the Areopagite. Dionysius was a 5th or 6th century Syrian monk who had learned his mysticism from Porphyry, who got it from Plotinus, who was a Neoplatonist, and who probably got uh, a great deal of stimulation from the intellectual world of Alexandria. And Alexandria, in the early years of the Christian era, was a tremendous exchange place between East and West. Buddhist monks visited Alexandria. It was uh, one of the great centers of trade between Rome and India. And as you may know, all Rome's gold eventually went to India for the purchase of pepper. And uh, as a result of this, the Roman economy collapsed. 
they bought too much luxury from India. India, in exchange, got Roman architecture. And uh, you see a lot of Roman architecture in Indian temples. But Alexandria was the great center for the Gnostics and for Christian theology. And some of the greatest theologians, Clement, Origen, Athanasius, St. Cyril, all worked out of Alexandria. But now going back to this strange monk, Dionysius, it was he who first put around the idea in Christian circles that there was such a thing of the knowledge, as the knowledge of God by faith, by agnosia, really, by unknowing. And he, in a book which he wrote, a very short book called The Theologia Mystica, he wrote a treatise on the higher knowledge of God, which might be quoted directly from the Upanishads in certain parts of it. The last section of it reads like the Mandukya Upanishad, because it's a series of negation. It says what God is not. And he goes very far because he says that God is not one. He says our idea of unity falls far short of what God is. So does our idea of trinity. So does our idea of spirit, our idea of mind, of justice, of love. All these things are not really God. And he says in another place, if anybody having seen God understood what he had seen, what he would have seen would not have been God, but some creature of God, less than God, some sort of angel or something like that. It's perfectly amazing to consider the influence that this man had. For writing under the name of Dionysus the Areopagite, he became identified, you see, with St. Paul's first convert in Athens. And legend has it that he was the first bishop of Athens and was martyred in Gaul. Now, where he's known as St. Denis. But St. Thomas Aquinas looked upon the writings of Dionysus the Areopagite as having the highest authority. And you could, if all the texts of Dionysus' work had been lost, you could restore most of it from quotations in St. Thomas. He wrote really two very important books. One was the one I said, the Theologia Mystica. The other was called The Divine Names. And these two books presented the two phases of his theology. The book called The Divine Names was a discussion on the nature of God in terms of what God is like, by analogy. And this kind of knowledge of God he called cataphatic, from the Greek phime, to speak or say, kata, meaning uh, to say according to, that is to say to speak by analogy. Where he used, though, entirely negative language about God, this sort of discourse was called apophatic. And the word apo meaning away from, to talk away from. Just as a sculptor, when he makes an image, reveals the image by removing stone. And so Dionysius explained that one attains the knowledge of God by discarding concepts which is exactly what the Hindus mean when they say, uh, of God one can only say, neti, neti, not this, not this, not any conception. Thus in Hindu philosophy, the highest state of consciousness in samadhi is called nirvikalpa samadhi, which means literally non-conceptual. Vikalpa means a concept. Nir is a negation. So the non-conceptual knowledge now, people have greatly misunderstood this. They have imagined that unknowing the state of the highest contemplation was the acquisition of a blank mind from which you first discarded thought, you went on to discard perception, you went on to discard any kind of sensory content in awareness until you were, so far as anyone could say, aware of nothing. And they supposed that this kind of catatonic state was mystical consciousness. This is often believed in India. If you go to the Vedanta Society and ask, what do you mean by nirvikalpa samadhi, 
they will tell you that the one in that state has no consciousness whatsoever of the sensory world. That he is completely absorbed, as you sometimes see Hindu holy men sitting in a state where they are blind and deaf to everything going on around them. The founder of Chinese Zen, known as Huinan, described people like that as no better than pieces of rock and lumps of wood. He said it's a very serious mistake indeed to confuse sunyata, the Sanskrit word for the great void, which is both the ultimate reality and the consciousness thereof. He said it's a great mistake to confuse it with nothingness. It is rather to be thought of as space, or like space, because space is not empty. It contains the whole universe. And so in the same way, the state of mind of a person who is truly enlightened is not empty. It contains everything. But like space, it is not stained by what it contains. And it's often said in Zen imagery, you can't hammer a nail into space. You can't spit on the sky and soil it. If you try, the spit will just return and hit your own face. So they go on to say the consciousness in all of us, your basic mind is like space. It is completely pure. But of course by purity, they don't mean unsexual which is, of course, what purity generally means in the Western world. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. A person who is pure in heart is generally understood as one who never has any naughty thoughts. You know what naughty means? It means vain, negative, empty. A naughty person, therefore, is one who doesn't amount to anything, it's just nothing. That's the real meaning. But uh, this misunderstanding of the nature of contemplation existed not only in India, from which it was transmitted to China, but also in the West. You read many treatises on Western mysticism, and there's still the feeling that getting into a deep, deep trance, sometimes called rapture, again, the word rapture has undergone some transformation. We talk about rapture as people being beside themselves with pleasure. But to be rapt means to be taken away from the body. So also ecstasy, we now interpret as meaning uh, in a state of high pleasure. But it means to be outside yourself, to stand outside yourself. Your soul has left you, it is with God. As Arabs say of all crazy people, be kind to them. They're not here, their soul is with God. But actually, if it can be true, as Buddhists say, that nirvana and samsara are one, and if it can be true, as Christians say, that the spirit can be made flesh, the word can be made flesh, then obviously the highest form of man is not sitting in a trance like a lump on a log with a perfectly blank mind. Because if that were the highest state of consciousness, it would be an exclusive state of mind, a state of mind that shuts out life. And in that sense, it could not qualify for being what the Hindus call non-dualistic. They always speak of the highest reality as being not one, because one excludes many. Not nothing, because nothing excludes something not being, because being excludes non-being, and vice versa. And so they use this word non-dual to mean that which doesn't exclude anything, which, as it were, has no outside. As we say, space has no outside. You can only have outsides inside space. You can't have any outsides outside space. There is no outside space, even though space may be curved and finite. So... If you want to think, incidentally, of that uh, curved space, go and take a look at a photograph in um, The Life, a book on mathematics, where there's a picture of a Klein bottle, 
which is a three-dimensional Merbius strip. A Merbius strip, you know, is a piece of paper that is twisted once and then joined. And it has only one side and only one edge. Now, a Klein bottle is a three-dimensional Merbius strip, and it only has one inside. It has no outside. You can say it has an inside and no outside, or it has an outside and no inside. It's a fabulous little, little trick. But there's something like that would be the nature of space, uh, as that which does indeed tra transcend the opposites. Um, <laughs> not quite. Now, we'd have to do one extra move on a serpent to make it into a Klein bottle. Uh, you'd have to tuck its head through the ins through the side of its skin and make the aperture through the mouth continuous with the inside of the serpent towards the tail, you see. That's more or less what a Klein bottle is. <laughs> so, uh, what I'm getting to, I'm uh, giving you something out of the general history of religions to show that what has been meant by the mystical state, the state of samadhi or awakening in certain traditions, is not this state of trance, but a state of consciousness in which you can perfectly well carry on your daily affairs. And of course, what is meant by a bodhisattva as the ideal type of a Buddhist person is that he is not wrapped, that he is actively engaged in the life of the world because he has gone beyond the illusion that nirvana is to be found away from everyday life. So what is then the point of meditation? Why meditate? Why do you have to crawl off into a hole or go to a Zen monastery or uh, retire and be quiet when this is only a withdrawal? Is there anything to be said for it? Well, meditation is in that, in that sense as a practice, as a discipline, is a very curious problem. Because from one point of view it's a help, and from another point of view a hindrance. And I think we have to understand, first of all, that meditation exercises are medicinal rather than dietary. The same could be said of LSD. A medicine, not a diet. Uh, something that um, is described in Zen as when you want to open a door or summon someone to open the door for you, you pick up a brick and you knock on the door. But you don't carry the brick into the house. When you need a raft for crossing a stream, you cross the stream on the raft, but you leave the raft on the bank at the other side. You don't go carrying it around. But a lot of people, when they get into meditation or they get into religion or into um, any kind of exploration of this sort, turn the door into a revolving door and keep on going round and round and round and never get through. They say, what a gas it is to be in this revolving door. So then a good definition of a parasite is a person who goes through a revolving door on someone else's push. So there are all sorts of people in the religious racket who are uh, going through revolving doors. And they're very bitter about people who walk right through and leave the door behind because they say, well, you haven't paid enough respect. You must really understand religious one-upmanship. It's a tremendously important thing. And don't be caught out by this because what happens is there's a little game going on which I'm going to initiate you into. And it's played in Zen, which is... It, it works like this. <laughs> if you go to a teacher and ask for spiritual instruction or even if you come to a seminar like this, you are, by doing that, confusing yourself because you are looking for what you're asking for outside, as if someone else could give it to you, as if you didn't have it. So the teacher knows that as long as you do that, you haven't understood. But it, he doesn't just tell you to go away. Or we may sometimes uh, just say, go away, I'm too busy. And in any, in any case, I can't tell you anything. Well, people won't take that for an answer. They won't take no for an answer. And furthermore, if he just said, go away, they would just find some other teacher who would exploit them and uh, maybe keep them as followers for years.
and acquire a great deal of money by so doing. But what he does is another thing. He tries to give them the put down, as if to say, you have a great long distance to go yet. Your attainment is uh, not at all perfect. And uh, where uh, they, they're always talking about other sects and other schools and saying, well, they haven't really got the point, you see? So that you keep losing faith in yourself and uh, feeling, my goodness, I haven't yet attained this thing. And that keeps you working. Not all the time. You're being talked out. It's like someone who's a pickpocket and he's stolen your own watch and is selling it to you. But just so long as you can be talked out of yourself, you deserve to be. Now, you become very aware of this. If you ever do momentarily slip into some sort of a mystical experience, uh, you become aware of this tremendous gamesmanship going on. Uh, and you see it as sort of continuous with, the, with all sorts of cosmic games that are going on of uh, creatures eating other creatures up and um, the creatures that get eaten, of course, transform themselves into the creatures that eat them and then in turn uh, eat other creatures. And uh, you, you see the whole hide-and-seek game going on and then you realize very clearly that the state of development that you are in now is... Uh, no better and no worse than anybody else's state. Because it's like uh, space again. Which planet is in, or which star is in the best position? Well, it's all equal. They're all in the middle. Any one can be considered as the center one. Any point on a sphere is the center of the surface of the sphere. So, you know, in the same way, everybody, in all his behavior, whatever he's doing, whether we call him from a certain point of view sick, or whether we call him healthy, whether we call him good or bad, neurotic, normal, psychotic, sane, uh, all the manifestations are just like uh, the leaves on the trees. And uh, in each uh, being, in a unique way, is, as Christians would say, manifesting the will of God. So, they really, from that point of view, see, there is nothing to do to attain Buddhahood. Nothing at all. But you see, that's very difficult to understand because a lot of people, when they hear that there's nothing to do, try to do nothing. And you can't. Because you are karma. And karma means action. You can't do nothing. But uh, the thing you're looking for, or think you're looking for, is what you're doing. Is what's called you. Only, of course, as we all know, uh, we've got ourselves into the idea that oneself is so difficult to see. Because it's like, uh, as I've often said, trying to bite your own teeth or look into your own eyes, and you can't find it. It's always behind. It's like your head is, uh, from the optical point of view, a blank space. Neither light nor dark. It's right in the middle of everything. And so, one of the great tricks of gurus is to set people looking for their heads. There's a famous story of a king in India in ancient times called Yajnadatta. And one morning he woke up and reached out for his mirror and brought it over. No head. He was looking in the wrong side of the mirror. And you know, he was kind of bleary-eyed and had a hangover. So he summoned servants and said, Ye gods, I've lost my head. Find it. And uh, they said, But your majesty, it's there on your shoulders. He said, It is not. I can't see it in the mirror. Nobody can show me my head. So they were rushing all over the place, looking for the head. Now the trick to that is, of course, that uh, you are perfectly well aware of your head only not in a form in which you expect to be aware of it. You expect to be aware of your own head in the same way as you're aware of other people's heads. But that wouldn't be true of you because you've got an inside view on your head. 
you have an outside view on of other people's heads because, of course, you're taking an inside point of view. But the way in which you are aware of your head is in terms of what you are seeing and hearing because all sights and all sounds are what the nerves inside your head are doing. That's how to be aware of one's head. You are aware, therefore, of yourself, the mysterious self that you have, in terms of experience. Because there isn't really any difference. But that always escapes people, you see. So perpetually, so long as you don't understand that, you can be talked into going on to all kinds of weird excursions. And just so long as you believe it, you're a sucker. You're hooked. And it takes a tremendous inner confidence and nerve finally to say, hey, don't pull that stunt on me anymore. I, uh, I see through your game. And uh, because gurus are very clever at putting you down. But they're just trying to see how strong you are. Testing you out. See if they can hoodwink you. So long as they can, you see, they're going to go on doing it because they're going to get you to the point where they can't do it to you anymore. Then they'll graduate. And so, uh, one of Rinzai's students, after he saw through it, said, well, there wasn't much in Rinzai's Buddhism after all. Of course there wasn't. He said boldly and straight out, my teaching is just like using an empty fist to deceive a child. You know, when you play games with a child and pretend you've got something here, and the child goes into all kinds of um, tizzy to get you to open your hand and show what it is, and then there's nothing. Fooled. So you, so you, you can be fooled, as long as you can be fooled. When you can't be fooled, you don't ask the question anymore. Because it's all become clear. It's all become clear that there is no puzzle about this universe. What makes you think there are puzzles about this universe? Very simple reason. You're trying to explain it. And when you explain things, what, you would, what do you mean by explanation? There are several meanings of explanation. There's really one basic meaning. But first of all, to be able to translate what is happening into terms of words or numbers. In other words, to describe. But a real explanation is not just a description. It's a description which enables us to control what we are describing. But didn't we see in the last session that to control the world is not really what we want to do? So that if all explanations have as their function enabling us to control things, then maybe an explanation isn't what we wanted. And furthermore, you can very simply see that what makes things complicated is explaining them. When somebody explains to you how a flower works, and he's a great botanist, and analyzes all the innards of the flower, and shows the channels, the fibers, the processes of reproduction, and uh, so on that go on in it, everybody stands fascinated. See, how complicated that is. How clever God must have been to create that flower, to have all that complexity going. It isn't complicated at all. It's only complicated when you start thinking about it. Because... The vehicle of words is a very clumsy one. And when you try to talk about the processes of nature, what is complicated is not the processes of nature, but trying to put them into words. That's as complicated as trying to drink up the ocean with a fork. It takes forever. And so this intense complexity that we see in everything is created by our attempt to analyze it all and so what we do is, you see, when we analyze, we use our eyes and ears as scalpels, and we dissect everything. And we have to put a label on every piece we chop off. And so we scalpelize, and we get it right down to atoms, getting finer and finer, and we suddenly thought, well, we've got to the end of it, because the word atom means what is not cuttable, atomos. 
Uh, but then he found we could cut the atom. And lo and behold, big fleas had to put fleas upon their backs to bite them. And it goes on forever. There is no end to the minuteness which you can unveil through physical investigation. For the simple reason that the investigation itself is what is chopping things into pieces. And the sharper you can sharpen your knife, the finer you can cut it. And the knife of the intellect is very sharp indeed. And the sophisticated instruments that we can now make, there's probably no limit to it. But in a way, all that is vain knowledge. In a way. Because, you see, it, it, what it does is it gives you the illusion that you've solved your problem when you have controlled certain things and you have solved certain problems, practical problems. You say, fine, more of that, please. Let's go on solving problems. And then you do. And you create a world of people, as we are today, far more comfortable than people who lived in the 19th century. Just remember the troubles of going to a dentist when you were children, or some of you when you were children, of um, medicine, of uh, badly heated homes, of uh, all sorts of things that we don't put up with anymore. But the problem is we keep running into this thing that all constant stimulations of consciousness become unconscious. And when we take it as a matter of course to have certain comforts, then we switch the level on which we worry. When you solve a whole set of problems, people find new ones to worry about. And after a while, you begin to get that haven't we been here before feeling. Aren't we just going round on a cycle and doing the same old thing over and over and over again because we don't realize that we're ta chasing our own tails? By an eternally recurrent process of not knowing who you are. That is the hide and seek. That is the nature of what the Hindus call the Manvantara and the Pralaya, the period of the Manvantara in which the worlds are manifested and the period of the Pralaya in which the worlds are withdrawn from manifestation. In and out, in and out. Evermore came out by the same door as in I went. The thing is, to get to the point where you can see that you are doing that in every moment of your existence, with every tiny little atom of your body, you now, at this minute, you see, are the whole, the whole system of inning and outing. In other words, you often think, perhaps, um, maybe a long, long time ahead, I shall reach the point where I wake up from manifestation and overcome the world illusion and discover that I am the supreme reality behind all this diversification. My friends, there is no diversification. In other words, what you call diversification is your game. In the same way as you chop the thing and then you say it is made of pieces. Because you forget that you cut it. And so when you see the world is complicated and that there are life problems and that uh, you, you might one day succeed, see, hundreds and hundreds of people are running like mad after something that they call the, that is success and they have no idea what it is. So in exactly the same way, the guru is keeping you running and running after spiritual attainment. You don't know what you want. So where Krishnamurti is so clever. Because he says... If you ask me for enlightenment, how can you ask me for enlightenment? If you don't know what it is, how do you know you want it? Is that any concept you have of it will be simply a way of trying to perpetuate the situation you're already in. If you think you know what you're going out for, all you're doing is you're seeking the past, what you already know, what you've already experienced. Therefore, that's not it, is it? Because you say you're looking for something quite new. But what do you mean new? What's your conception of something new? Well, you figure I can only think about it in terms of something old. Something I once had. So he doesn't say anything. He doesn't indicate anything positively. Everybody says, why are you so negative? 
Why don't you give us something to hang on to? Well, if the simple answer is it would be spurious. You don't need anything to hang on to. You're it. You don't need a religion. But then you say, well, uh, well, what is all this religious stuff about then? Why don't we just forget it? You can try. By all means, just go away. Don't go to gurus. Don't go to church. Don't enter philosophical discussions. Forget it. But then you'll realize that by having consented to forget it, you're still seeking. What a trap. What can you do? You see, if you stay here and listen to me or to anyone else who comes around here, you're fooling yourself. But if you go away, you're fooling yourself too. Because <laughs> you still think that's going to Im improve your situation. It won't. And therefore, when you discover that it doesn't, you'll think, well, maybe it was a mistake to go away. And you come back to the guru. And he looks at you and says, uh, 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 uh. You are very undisciplined, very, uh, very uh, inferior student. And uh, you, you need to apply yourself. Well, as I explained, I explained what he's doing. But it comes down, in a way, to a sort of contest with the guru. You see? Well, will you call his bluff? You're afraid to. Because you might discover that if you do call his bluff, he's no better than you are. Well, that's what you're supposed to find out. But without being cynical about it. He's as divine as you are. But you've got to call the bluff. There's going to be a showdown. And it's, it's a double bind. The whole situation's a double bind. Because it doesn't do any good to stay here, and it doesn't do you any good to go away. Either to do something about it, or to do nothing about it. Now then, there's something else. When you understand that, and when you realize that um, there's nothing to realize, because it's all here, then what are you going to do? Well, of course, this is the sense of the Zen poem. Supernatural activity and marvelous power. Drawing water, carrying fuel. You know? Do whatever one does as a human being. But there's a little element of Philistinism in that. It's like when a child is pestering father or mother with all sorts of questions. They finally get down to the deepest metaphysical problems. They say, oh, shut up and eat your donut. Yeah. And... Um, I wouldn't say that, you see, at this point. Because uh, life, as one looks at it, you see, is in fact a celebration of itself. When you look out at night at the stars and you really wonder, good God, what is all that about? Well, it's a firework display. And it's celebrating High Holy Day. And it's whoopee. And the whole world is whoopee. It's a kind of exuberance. And therefore, the proper function of religion is digging this. It's not seeking. It's not seeking anything. But is, in a way, thanksgiving. That's why, of course, the Christians were right in calling the Mass the, the Eucharist, the Thanksgiving. Only they had such a complicated way of thinking about it that nobody could understand it. So, they're in, in religion... All religious exercises, whether they are meditative or whether they are ritualistic, are whoopee. They are not something you do in order to attain anything. They are like art forms, like dancing. They are expressive of attainment, of the attainless attainment. So here's another hang-up for you. When you go to Mr. Suzuki who runs the Zen center, he's a good disciple of Dogen, who brought Zen, uh, a certain school of Zen to Japan in the uh, 13th century. Dogen said, you can't sit and meditate unless you're already a Buddha. In which case, why meditate? Well, meditation is just the way a Buddha sits. And he called this sitting just to sit. Not to t attain enlightenment. Because the minute you do that, you see, you're not meditating. So you only become a, a good meditator if you're not looking for anything. And therefore, you realize what a great thing it is to be able to sit. And what a great thing it is not to dissect the world with your analytical intellect. 
To be able to look out at the water or the trees or at the floor and the light on it in front of you without calling it light or floor or trees or thinking that it has parts or thinking that uh, it's complicated. It isn't. So when you can sit without thinking, not with an empty mind, mind you, I'm going back to that point, not with an empty mind, but just um, an un, a non-analytic mind, a non-probing mind, uh, where you're not creating problems all the time, by trying to control it, by trying to control your mind, by trying to control your experience, what you see and hear, you then just simply discover that there is no way of controlling what you're experiencing, because what you're experiencing is you. And to try and really fundamentally control that, this is going around the circle. So, if I would say to you now, what you have to learn is to let it happen, that's wrong too. There's no one to let it happen. If I say to you, accept your experience, um, be calm and open to things, that again perpetuates the illusion that you're something different from it. And so we go round and round. But if there are some people who want to get together and like we would get together to play poker or to um, have a walk, go fishing or sail a boat, if there are some people who want to get together to meditate and to have rituals and to chant, uh, great. It's an art form. And you can only use it and make it a good art form if you're not using it to get something. And this is what really is the bane of temples all over the world. You go into Buddhist temples where they theoretically don't believe in any god. But there are the people praying. And they are all doing it in order that we get a male child next time around or that the horse recover from a disease or that mama gets cured of the dropsy and all these petitions are going on and on and on. People are always coming to the temple to ask for something. Lowbrow people for lowbrow things. Highbrow people for highbrow things. And there are all the vendors sit outside and sell souvenirs and magic and charms. And all the people go in and do this. And all these serious priests sitting there, really having to keep up face and uh, say, yes, uh, uh, we can provide these services. <laughs> On the other hand, if you go in to one of these temples, along with all the faithful followers, and have a ball, buy a, buy a bead, buy a candle, buy a this, buy that, buy some incense, go in and dig this great thing going on, salute the Buddhas or the Christ or the altars or the crucifixes or what you will, but don't take it seriously. And this is one of the great important transformations of today in our consciousness is that a great many people are finding out that religion is not supposed to be taken seriously. This is a shocking thing to many people. Uh, there used to be an old saying that a religion is dead when the priests laugh across the altars. That's true in one sense. When the priests know that they've got a racket going and they don't believe one word of it and they're laughing across the altar because of all these suckers around uh, doing it, then it's true uh, the religion is dead. But when the priests laugh at the altars, because they're having such fun, because this whole scene is so beautiful, uh, well, it's the difference between some stuffy old Buddhist priest humming a sutra and Allen Ginsberg chanting a sutra. Uh, that's a thing to hear. Because the priests are going, you know, they go on for interminable, it's a bore. They're sick of it. But they get paid for it. This is magical. But when Allen Ginsberg chants the sutra, everybody gets in a circle and he gets these little bells and they get going. It's just like a, it's like a, um, a jam session where everybody is absolutely delighted. Well, that's the way to do it. And if you can't do it that way, forget it.
Я полетел за тобою. Что нам земля зелена? Что нам любимых объятий? Здесь обретая свободу без края и дна. Мы с облаками, как братья. Это биение кры. Нам по ночам только снится. Здесь все забыто, где ждут простор. Здесь мы с тобой волнуемся. Мы летим и летим. Только бы не возвращаться. Господи, да, но дышаться простором вой. Вольности, да, но дышаться. Но убеждает меня Грозной земли тяготенье И как расплата за взлет минувшего дня Наша свобода падение Так мы не птицы, а шаль. Жаль, что живем не крылата, Лишь поднимаем глаза, А на сердце печать. Будто летать отдаха, Мы вылетим голубой, В небо летим голубой. Если крылья мне тоже пожалуй, я полетел за тобой.